Aren't you glad there is a one God, Jesus' name, Holy Ghost, apostolic, solid, Bible-believing, loving, kind, friendly, anointed, on-fire church in McKinney, Texas, United States. A place where souls can come and find hope and deliverance and grace in time of need in this hour people are hungry for something real and the real true presence of God is here I've enjoyed worshiping him with you and I want to direct your attention to first Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12 I like your format appreciate my wonderful beautiful wise Proverbs 31 wife being with me sister Treadwell and uh, I'm a blessed man I'm a blessed man and uh, my mom and dad in California just celebrated 60 years of being married and I thought well we're halfway there we're halfway there uh, a little more than halfway yeah so it's like hey she's put up with me I'm a hard guy to live with I'll just be honest with you and she's put up with me so uh, I try to stay away from cliches but she is the better half so if you don't understand my message just she'll interpret for you what I said because she's an interpreter so first Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12 to, uh, fight the good fight of faith I'm concerned that we've forgotten how to fight you got to fight not with these but spiritually lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art or are also called that's not art like painting that's art like are and has professed a good profession before many witnesses lay hold on eternal life and with the Lord's help my title is get a grip get a grip look at your neighbor tell him it's time to get a grip hallelujah let's lift our hands Jesus thank you that you are here with us the presence that we feel that brings joy and peace the only thing that can but most of all thank you for giving us eternal life thank you for writing our names in the Lamb's book of life and for anyone here today that is not yet at that place may your grace draw them to that special place just like you drew us hallelujah hallelujah we give you praise for what you're doing and everyone said thank you Jesus you may be seated Paul is instructing Timothy how to stay focused on the mission and as a child I had a hard time focusing in school I was the class clown even some of my teachers called me that had a lot of fun but didn't get very good grades until I got the Holy Ghost true story my grades went from C's and D's to A's and B's after I got the Holy Ghost but I it took me a while to find my groove in life Jesus became my purpose and that made the best difference of all but you know even living for God sometimes you can lose your trajectory in life and we have to take those times to focus in prayer but I have found in my short half a century on earth that what helps me focus as someone who used to struggle to focus what has helped me is to know my purpose to know why I'm on earth and when you realize your purpose for why you're on earth it changes everything and when Jesus becomes our purpose it doesn't mean everything's going to be smooth sailing or that you're suddenly going to become wealthy overnight but you're going to make it <laughs> but like I said I'm concerned a lot of Christians are just living sort of a float along 
existence, and I'm not trying to be judgmental, but I think that a lot of what we have, and I don't mean here, but in our world, is a cotton candy Christianity. And that's even prophesied in the Bible. The itching ears, just only tell me the stuff I want to hear. And we're, we're afraid to hear anything that might cause us to need to seek the face of God and make adjustments in my life. I'm thankful for my pastor back in the 80s, Brother Shoemake, who wasn't afraid to preach with conviction. He preached with love. And I think that was a generation of preachers where you found a lot of convicting preaching. And I'm concerned we become afraid of that. And I don't mean that we should go back to just all hellfire and brimstone. My aunt was an evangelist back in the late 50s. My mom's sister, I never heard her preach because she stopped before I was born. But I'm, I preached for some pastors for the sales who remembered my aunt Flo from the late 50s. And uh, this one particular pastor in California said, well, I don't believe in women preachers. He said, but your aunt sure was anointed. <laughs> I thought it was funny that he was acknowledging her anointing, even though he didn't believe in women preachers, but whatever. But uh, <laughs> it's just a different day, I suppose, but not to dwell on that too much, but a lot of people received the Holy Ghost under her ministry, but she uh, sadly kind of drifted from the Lord, although she told me she never stopped speaking in tongues, but I thought, well, why can't you go to church then? But anyway... She told me some stories, and she said, you know, Craig, I never felt like I had fully preached unless I broke the heels off my shoes, and my her jet black hair came down, and she she would scream so loud, she said, she, after she was done preaching, she'd go back in the bathroom and spit up blood. Maybe there was something wrong with her throat. I don't know, because I've never spit up blood, and I've, I've screamed a little bit in my time. I've got a license to scream. <laughs> But, but uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's like, I'm not suggesting that it has to be that way. Because the Lord can show up in a whisper in the still small voice. The Lord can show up in a shout and often does. And everything in between. Shout with the voice of triumph. And then there's times when we are quiet in the presence of God. And he speaks to us inside. And then we see in the Bible there are times the Lord spoke audibly. But Paul is instructing Timothy to flee the temptation of pursuing a lavish lifestyle in our context. And it kind of seems random that Paul would say this to Timothy in his epistle to him. But he's wanting Timothy to be focused on the mission. And perhaps Timothy was in an atmosphere where a lot of those temptations existed. Otherwise, why would he even say it to him? I was listening to an interview from an ex-Navy SEAL the other day who basically talked about how he was raised in an average home and wasn't, didn't come from a wealthy home at all, and he didn't really know what to do with his life. And I don't think this guy's a Christian. I don't remember his name, but uh, the point is the person interviewing him was a pretty high-profile person interviewing him from London, England, and he was interviewing him, and, 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 and uh, this guy, this ex-Navy SEAL, the whole reason why I was interviewing him is because he went into the military because he said he just was being honest. He said he didn't really know what to do with his life. And be, becoming a Navy SEAL is very difficult, of course, and uh, the qualifications, I'm sure, are out of this world. But he was successful at that, and that kind of gave him a feeling of purpose in his life. And later on, when he, when he left uh, full service in the military, he got involved in some different endeavors that grew into a very nice, wealthy lifestyle for him. And I'm not against people being wealthy at all. Um, the point I'm making by bringing that up, because we could list a lot of examples, is the interviewer, this, this particular guy, his, his different things brought a lot of wealth into his life. And uh, different businesses wound up with like 90 employees and all this and different things. A lot of what he said, I, of course, did not agree with. But that's, that's not really the point because he was saying some things that I found were very interesting. And the guy interviewing him asked him, well, has this all this wealth, uh, multiple millions of dollars in his life made you happy? And the guy's sitting there in a T-shirt and a pair of shorts 
and and the guy interviewing him's in a full three piece suit. And he's like, "Can we get you in a full three piece suit?" And he's like, "You're never going to get me in a full three piece suit." <laughs> and this guy's a multimillionaire, and he said, "I don't I don't want to look like all that, whatever." But uh, he said, "Well, has all this made you happy?" And he said, "Let me tell you something. When the latest Ferrari came out, I went and bought it." He said, it made me happy for about 20 minutes. He said, it just, I got tired of it after about 11 months, I sold it. He's like, really? He's like, yeah. He's like, here's the problem with being super wealthy and super famous. It raises your bar so high so that average life is so boring. He said, and that's the problem. He said, and the fame is the worst. He said, I don't want it. He said, but once you get to that place, and I've never been there at all, I'm just one dolphin in God's vast ocean, but he said, once that happens, there's no getting it back. He said, you lose all your privacy. He said, but what about all your money? He said, well, it's kind of nice to be able to buy what I want, when I want, where I want. He said, but it's just really more stressful. And he said, well, has it brought you happiness? He said, not at all. He said, none of this makes me happy. In fact, he said, I'm way more stressed out than I was before I had all this. He said, so then what makes you happy? He said, hanging out with my friends and doing thing that doing things with each other that cost nothing. He said, hanging out with my buddies from when we were Navy SEALs, that's what makes me happy. And the one thing I took away from his interview is relationships is what made this guy happy. And so in my mind, I took it to the next level and I thought, well, it's my relationship with Jesus that makes me happy and my relationship with my wonderful wife and my children and our grandkids and hanging out with people that I love and friends that are close and dear. That's because God made us to be relational creatures. There's nothing wrong with being blessed and being well off and we all need roofs over our head. We need transportation. We need clothes. We need stuff. God knows that. But that's not where our happiness and joy is. Amen? So Paul just took the liberty to give Timothy a little tip. Nothing wrong with making a living. We all have to have money. There's nothing wrong with money. It's not money that's evil. It's the love of it. He's basically telling him, don't chase a lavish lifestyle. Don't make money your God. Don't allow all of that because really you're just chasing a mirage. You ever seen a mirage? You know what a mirage is, right? When I was a kid, we used to get mirages on our street. And I'd look at them and I'd think to myself, you know, I'm seven, eight years old old and I think it looks so real and I'd go booking it down the street trying to chase the whatever that it looked like a puddle in the street and it was you know 90 degrees and it was nothing it was just a mirage and we find ourselves sometimes chasing things that aren't going to amount to anything I don't want to spend a good portion of my life chasing something that isn't going to go anywhere I've got one life to live you've got one life to live we're not cats we don't have nine lives we've got one life to live but I see people I've known people and I'm sure so of you that act like they're immortal they do things it seems like they think that if something happens and they die in the moment of chasing whatever pleasure they think it's going to give them maybe it's drugs or something and well okay no big deal because I'll just come back as somebody else <laughs> and you think I'm being crazy but some people believe that kind of stuff but instead, Paul told Timothy, now he's talking to a pastor that he's training, but this applies to all of us. Pursue things that have eternal value and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Without an eternal revelation, most people would compare those two realms of all the whatever the world has to offer and what God has to offer as though we are getting the shorter end of the stick. Have you ever had that happen? Have you ever had anybody mock your Christianity? Or maybe they weren't outright mocking you, but they just kind of cocked their head and like, you know, really, I don't know that I want to live that way. I don't know that that really is, I don't know that I want to give up all of whatever they think they would have to give up. <laughs> of course, you and I know 
that we did not get the short end of the stick because we have an eternal revelation. We have an understanding that this life is only the earnest of our inheritance, which is the down payment. In other words, this is just the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And yes, living for God, we know because we have experienced it and do experience it is the best way to live. How many of you know you have to experience Jesus to understand how amazing he is? <laughs> it's not enough to just look at something from a distance. You know, people might pass a church driving down the highway and think, oh, all that religious stuff. I just don't. It just seems, you know, it doesn't seem real. It's not real in your life until you experience Jesus for yourself. Right. And so we know that we're living the way God wants us to live in the Christian life, the spirit filled life. And that doesn't mean we always do what we should do. <laughs> it doesn't mean that we don't need to fine tune our lives at times. But I'm talking about the life lived for God is the right way to live. Because when we've had a glimpse of heaven, we see everything differently, do we not? Right. We see everything differently. That's what happened to me. And I would assume that's the testimony most people have when they are born again of the water and of the spirit. I mean, my friends thought I was crazy. I was not raised in church. I won't go into my whole testimony, but my friends thought I'd lost my living mind. Really? I mean, I was only 15, had some cool friends, had a good life, uh, you know, good parents, amazing parents, worked hard, provided a good life for us. None of that was really uh, the problem. The problem was I was an empty shell. And as, you know, grew up in a, in a good part of town. And uh, if you just looked at me on the outside, you might think, well, Craig seems okay. Except I was an empty shell. And it's not because I was a theologian. To the contrary. I mean, I'd read the Bible some. Had heard some preaching. But it wasn't really Pentecostal preaching. But I had a little bit of exposure to some Christianity, went to a few churches, camps, and here and there, had a touch of God to a degree, but it wasn't really the power that I needed. It wasn't until I had the encounter with Jesus in a real way that I had a metamorphosis of my soul and a transformation of my spirit. And really, my friends thought I was going crazy, some of them. Some of them mocked me, but it didn't matter to me because I knew I had found what I needed to fill the void in my life. I don't even know that I could properly explain it. I tried, but I just didn't have all the understanding. I just knew that God was real, that living for God was the right way to live. And I also, and this sobers me up when I think about it, Pastor Rab, when I look back at the crossroads I was at in my life as a relatively young dude, I think to myself, I could have easily hardened my heart. What if I had? And it's often, I know God's merciful and I do believe that God will visit people many times throughout their life because he loves us the dangerous part is that the more we reject or maybe some people don't outright reject God they just have we just have a tendency to harden ourselves we just have a tendency to put up somewhat of a wall or we grow a thick skin which is what a callus how many anybody have calluses I got calluses on my hands <laughs> just from different things in life <laughs> and, uh, you know, a, cal a callus, you know, I guess you can benefit from having a few calluses on your palms. It can protect you, but I don't want to have a callous heart. I don't want to allow myself to reject the voice of God. And if we're not careful, we can develop a callous spirit. You can hear preaching all your life and just like, oh, that's just pastor, you know, just, he's just, he's just saying what, you know, and, and you can, you can develop deaf ears. You can develop a, a, a layer of just kind of like indifference in your spirit and you don't really allow the voice of God to sink into your heart and mind and soul. I want the word of God, not just when it's preached, but when I read it, when I hear it to sink within my spirit 
because the word is powerful. The problem is not with the word. The problem is with our ability to absor absorb it and let it do its work in our lives. Hallelujah. I saw everything differently. And I couldn't even really put it into words. Things that did not used to bother me. And again, this is when I was a teenager. Things that did not used to bother me. Whereas before, I could go to a party where everyone's drunk. I could hear cussing. I could be around this, that, and the other. And it wouldn't really bother me. But when I was filled with the Holy Ghost, and I received the Spirit of the only true righteous God in the universe, I would then walk into the atmosphere. Because just to be transparent with you, uh, I thought that I could keep hanging out with the same friends. I thought, here's what I did. I remember the last sip of alcohol all young people I had as a 15 year old I still remember I, rem I have a video clip in my head of the last sip of alcohol I haven't had any since 1986 I mean I've had a little NyQuil a couple times but I haven't had any intoxicating beverage and I'm not bragging it doesn't make me better than anybody else I'm saying I but I here was my rationale I thought well I'll still go with them to these parties uh, early 80s was insane we had these wild it was crazy brought home by police and all this kind of stuff and uh, so I remember the last sip of alcohol I had, but I thought, I'll, I'll, I'll keep going with because I have some really cool friends. They were the most popular guys in our whole campus and two or 3,000 people on our high school campus. So I thought, you know, I'll just, I'll just keep hanging out with them. I just won't drink. And they didn't know what was wrong with me. They're like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, nothing. I'm fine. But I'm, I'm a Christian now. Well, what? What do you mean you're a Christian now? Don't you like us? Well, of course I like you guys. But I, I love Jesus more. And so they, you know, it just didn't, it was, it just didn't work. And it just didn't work. So finally they'd pull up in my driveway and honk Friday night. Come on, Craig, get in the car with us. Because I didn't have my driver's license. And uh, I thought just, you know, hey, I invited him to church with me. And it just, it's like, you got it. You can't. You can't ride. You can't stay on that fence. You got to make a decision that I'm going all the way with Jesus, and so that's what I did. Because trying to ride the fence is misery, and Paul. The point Paul was trying to get through to Timothy is, you've got to know who you are. You've got to know where you stand, and you've got to get a grip on eternal life. You've got to get a grip on eternal life. And I know in our culture, it kind of became a cliche decades ago. But Paul's really telling him. Because if you don't have, a, listen, if you don't have a grip on that one thing, and I don't know who God's talking to here today. You know, I mean, God may be talking to some of our young people. He may be talking to some of us who are somewhere in the middle. He may be, I mean, it doesn't matter how old you are. If you don't have a grip on eternal life, nothing else is going to work. Can I hear a witness? That's why he said, fight the good fight of faith. I'm going to be honest with you. I had to fight for this. I don't mean physically, but I had to fight spiritually, emotionally, intellectually, I had to fight for this because it wasn't handed to me. I was not raised in church. And again, wonderful parents that I love, and they know I tell this. They know it's part of my testimony. But they didn't quite understand. They had a Pentecostal background before, way before I was born, back in the 50s. And God's restored some of that and refilled them with the Holy Ghost. But at the time, they didn't quite understand why I couldn't just go to the large non-denominational church down the street that had, you know, four or 5,000 people and amazing camps. And, and they were good people. Don't get me wrong. A lot of good things they were doing. I went to some of their camps. And... And a lot of amazing programs, a lot of wonderful people, a lot of them were my friends that I went to school with. So I'm not blasting them. But I literally heard the pastor who was a good teacher, I think it was a doctor, good teacher on a lot of subjects, but I literally heard him in the pulpit because some of the people were getting the Holy Ghost in prayer meetings at this large non-denom church. And some of them saw it in the book of Acts. And some of them were speaking in tongues in these prayer meetings. And I think it, I, he didn't know what to do with it. And I was just like, 
you know, 14 years old at the time, and I heard him stand in the pulpit and denounce it. And of course, you know, I did, I'm like, what, how, I mean, I, I didn't have the understanding then that I have now. So, you know, I'm not going to try to go up and, and correct the pastor, but I just in my own mind, I didn't know the Pentecostal glossary or anything, but just in my own mind, I saw it in the Bible. And I thought, if I see it in the Bible, how, how could somebody who has a doctorate in theology not see this? Because there has to be an opening of the understanding in the presence of God. And God will open that understanding to anybody who's hungry for it. God is looking for hungry souls. Am I right? Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. But our ability to stay in the fight is only as good as our grip. That's it. If you can't grip this, something else will grip you. It takes a decision, a determination to stay in the fight. Because you can be in the most amazing presence of God last night, last week, and what hits you between the eyes the next day or unexpectedly. How many of you know some of the worst trials hit us on it when we least expect it? There are things in this life, I don't care what pedigree you come from, <laughs> that can shake you to the core of your faith and cause you to question your walk with God, and sometimes even God himself. And we've all been there. We've all got the t-shirt, the coffee mug, and the magnet that goes on the fridge. We've all had experiences. What tries to destroy you will make you stronger if you don't quit. But you've got to be like that frog who's about to be swallowed by the pelican and he reaches around and grabs the throat of the pelican and chokes it out. Too many people quit too easily. Satan is looking for people who will quit when the heat is on. It's not the easy journey that makes us stronger. No pain. No gain. You see, the muscles and the tendons and the ligaments and the deltoids and the lats and the biceps and the triceps and the forearms, individual muscle groups can be strong. But your ability to grip is a combination of all those systems working together. And if you've ever injured a particular muscle, you know how debilitating it can be. I remember when I injured both of my shoulders and I didn't even know why. I don't know if it was from my little league pitching days or just what. And calcium deposits showed up later. I have no idea because I couldn't think of any particular thing. I've torn muscles before and it's no fun. I tore a muscle that swelled around my sciatic nerve and felt like someone was sawing my leg off. And Sister Treadwell said, I will never drive the trailer in the 90s. And I said, we can't get from upper Maryland to Baltimore unless you drive this thing because I'm in so much pain. And she remembers I was screaming. I was in so much pain. Felt like someone was literally sawing off my leg. You don't ever want sciatic pain, trust me. It's the worst. <laughs> and uh, so we've all been in pain. We could all talk about the pain that we've been in. But you're a stronger person. I'm a stronger person, not because of the easy times. And trust me, I don't invite pain. I don't want pain. I don't know of anybody who likes pain. I remember one time I was in the car with some friends. Again, this is BC. And uh, some dude in the neighborhood that went to a different high school had a reputation of being, you know, super tough. And you don't mess with this guy, Mike. Nobody messes with Mike. And we're, I'm in this car with three or four of my friends, and we saw him. And so someone said, get up on his bumper. And we're like, are you insane? That's Mike. No one messes with Mike. And we got up pretty close. We didn't ride his bumper, but we got pretty close. Close enough. I'm in the back seat. And Mike had a bumper sticker. It said, I heart pain. 
and I thought, you liar. <laughs> Nobody likes pain. But it's an image. You see, Satan wants us to think that he likes pain. Satan wants us to think. Now, I, I do believe Satan enjoys inflicting pain on the human race and on God's people. But how many of you know there's coming a day when Satan's going to be cast into the lake of fire and then we'll see how much pain he likes. But nobody likes, nobody in their right mind likes pain unless you're some sort of psychopath. But see, the enemy plays tricks with our mind. And he wants us to think that we can't make it, but we have news for the enemy. God's already given us a promise. They that endure to the end, the same shall be saved. I haven't come through my tests and trials and difficulties because I'm so great or because I'm so smart or because I'm just, you know, extra special. No, but by the grace of God, because I learned a long time ago, not because I'm so intellectual, but when trials come, I know where to go. I know to run to the cross. I know to go to my father who has the ability, who's already given us the victory. So I prophesy to someone here today who's going through a difficult time, you already have victory. You've just got to lay hold on eternal life. You've just got to get a grip on it. The victory's already there. Jesus already provided it. If you're waiting for God to do some next big humongous thing, he's already done it. For we have not an high priest who not, cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. You see, that word feeling there is singular. There's no S on the end of it. There's a distinct feeling of being forsaken in the midst of your trial, in the midst of your challenge. And Jesus felt it on the cross. Remember? Father, why have you forsaken me? He wasn't really forsaken. It was the flesh of God talking to the spirit of God. He had to be totally emptied out of everything to give us full and complete victory before he gave up the ghost and drew his final breath on that cross. There were multiple victories that Jesus won for us on the cross. And there have been times in my life, even as a oneness preacher, that I've gone through periods of depression and anxiety, which the two are closely linked. I don't have that so much anymore. The Lord's given me healing in multiple ways. And, and it was nothing severe. But I'm saying that sometimes people look at people in the ministry and they think, oh, well, it was just all handed to them and they've had it all easy. To the contrary. To the contrary. But any child of God, because there's no greater position in the kingdom of God than to be called a child of Jesus Christ. Which I love that. Because <laughs> that removes all the hierarchy. Yeah. And yeah, there's the fivefold ministry and there's all of that. But it's not I above you. It's we together as a team. Yes. <laughs> this is a team effort. And I don't care what position you have in life. Whether it be your job or your corporation or your business that you're associated with. There is no greater position than to know I'm a child of Jesus Christ. And I know the world doesn't get that. But you can be raised around this, and that's a good thing. How many of you know that's the will of God for us to raise our kids in this? Yes, sir, that's God's plan. Thank God for our Sunday school teachers who work so hard behind the scenes and teach our children. But we got as parents and grandparents, we got to step up to the plate and teach our kids too. And don't just leave it all up to them. But you can be raised around the church as much as that's God's plan all your life. But at some point... You've got to decide for yourself. I'm going to get a grip on this. And it, it is a conscious decision. You see, God's ever done it, already done it all. But if you don't decide, I'm going to let what God did transform my life, it's not going to do you really any good. How many people will be lost for eternity because they didn't make that point of decision? And that's why sometimes 
I have sobering moments to this day where I think to myself, what if I hardened my heart? When God was dealing with me in 1986 as a 15-year-old, wandering, trying to find my reason for being on this earth, what if I did not hear the still, small voice of God? What if I rejected it? What if I had listened to my friends, young people, and just said, well, you know, you're right. This is, now being a Christian is not cool. Being a Christian is not cool, which is a lie from the devil. It's not true. You can be a Christian and be cool. Hallelujah. You don't have to take a vow of nerdism. You know, <laughs> really. But your relationship with Jesus has to triumph over your desire to be cool. Or whatever else you want to be. <laughs> and in vogue and all this kind of stuff. Nothing wrong with having style. Nothing wrong with wanting to, you know, reasonably fit in with your friends. But not at the expense of your relationship with the Lord. But you've got to make a decision for yourself. Because your friends aren't going to get you to heaven. Your ancestry is not going to get you to heaven. I thank God for people that prayed for me. And I'm sure you thank God for people that prayed for you and do pray for you. But at the end of the day, we got to pray for ourselves. And that's not a selfish thing. What I mean is seek the face of God for ourselves. I don't just mean ask, 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 ask. I mean praise, 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 praise. And then worship on top of that. But you've got to get a grip on eternal life first. Or you're just going to wander the rest of your life and never find your purpose. And you're going to come to the end and just going to go by like, like that. The Bible says our lives are but as a vapor that appears for a little time. The good news, it's a choice. And there's no devil in hell that can prevent you from making that choice. But make a landmark about your choice. Because once you make the choice to live for God, there will be things that try to shake your choice. I heard a preacher one time say, and I, my wife might help me out here. What, what was the dude uh, when I was in my right mind? Hmm? Remember that one? Say it. Yeah, something like that. So in other words, what his title was, Later on, when things tried to shake his choice, he remembered he made the right choice when he was in his right mind. Because there will be things that will try to get you out of your right mind. <laughs> even as a, I'm talking even as a child of God. You're not crazy. You haven't lost your mind. But sometimes you got to look at yourself in the mirror and remind yourself... Remember the decision I made to live for God was the right decision. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> what do you think Job had to say to himself? I mean, he talked to God. Don't you think Job at some point thought he might be losing his mind? I've never been tried like Job. And I don't want to be. And I don't invite trials. We know God won't force us. Here's the good news. God won't force us. God will not force you. And Satan cannot stop you. God will not force you. And Satan cannot stop you. Satan has power. Satan has a lot of capabilities that we don't have. He used to be Lucifer. And so as one of God's top right archangels or whatever he was, some have called him the music minister of heaven. I'm sure he was a lot of stuff. And for an unspecified amount of time, Satan, Lucifer, learned how... Have you ever noticed? Because Lucifer understood how God works... When he rejected God and rebelled against God, most, if not all, of what Satan does is a direct counterfeit of what God does. And, and we could take that in a lot of directions, but it's so true. That is why so much of what Satan does initially is tempting. Because he knows how we are wired. So he will tempt us in areas that appeal to us. Otherwise, it's not a temptation. I mean, if you stick a head of broccoli in front of me, I know it's good for me. I know broccoli fights cancer, but I'm not really tempted by it. 
<laughs> now, if you get a half gallon of, you know, Brahms ice cream, then I might be tempted. Nothing wrong with ice cream, but I'm just saying. Satan knows what to bring to us to tempt us. And all the men said, yeah, I get it. But it all comes down to you, no matter who you are, making up in your own mind that you're tired of half in, half out. I know this. That's a recipe for misery. Half in, half out. You've got to be done with that. I may not be the smartest guy on the planet, but... I am somewhat of an extremist in the sense that when I do something, I go all in. I, I was that way in sports as a kid, and I'm that way with a lot of stuff. And it's, but it's, it's, it's because I decided that Jesus is going to be everything in my life. And so I took all that and I applied it to my walk with God. And it doesn't mean I'm always running around the church and, you know, jumping everywhere. Because there are times that God convicts my heart and I just got to get on my face before God and seek Him. But I like the correlations between spiritual and physical. And Paul's telling Timothy to get a grip on eternal life. And God created our hands... Everybody hold your hands up just, just a little bit like this. Those are beautiful hands. Beautiful hands. Now high five your neighbor. Beautiful hands. God created those hands. Think about all that your hands do. If you drove here, you're holding the steering wheel. If you ladies had to slap up your husband a little bit. Now hands do a lot. You bake, you cook. What would we do without our hands? And I always feel compassion for someone that doesn't. But God gave our, us the ability with our hands to grip. And it's an amazing science. 26% of the bones in our bodies are in our hands. That's a lot of bones. So it's, it's amazing how everything works together, though. It's not just your hand that has the ability to grip. So if I want to grip something, whatever it might be, microphone, my hand is depending on my shoulder and everything in between to grip. I mean, that doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that. The tendons, the ligaments, everything. You may not be on the platform or in the pulpit. You may not even have a position in the church. But if you're doing something for God, you're teaching someone a Bible study, you're praying for somebody, you're visiting someone in need, you're pulling the weeds. What did Jesus say? You have a greater reward when you do your alms in secret. If in your heart you're doing what God tells you to do, maybe the Lord just talks to you to become a friend with somebody. Got to be their friend before you can win them. And in the process of becoming their friend, you develop an understanding of who they are and compassion for their needs. You're ministering to them in a way that's led of the Spirit. Maybe you're the only one in the whole church that knows this person in the community and their salvation and them getting a grip on eternal life is hinged on you loving them in that journey to where they can get to that place where then all of a sudden they realize there's something different about you, something special about you, and they don't even know what it is. <laughs> Guy at the gym told me his shoulder was killing him. I said, well, hey, you mind if I pray for you right now? He's like, yeah, okay. Go ahead. And I just prayed a real brief. It wasn't some big thing because there were people around. I just kind of prayed a quiet prayer. Late, put my hand. I said, I'm going to put my hand on your shoulder because you probably never heard of that. <clears throat> a couple weeks later, I walked up to him. I said, how's your shoulder? He said, hey, that thing you did a couple weeks ago, could you do that again? He just said that thing. <laughs> you know, like the dude in the White House said the thing. <laughs> I'm saying that people don't, 
understand all of our Pentecostal lingo, but they 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 feel something. We may not we may not feel it. You ever put on a new cologne or perfume? And the first time you squirt it, you can, or in the store, it's like, oh, I like that. But then you wear it and you wear it, and pretty soon you can't smell it anymore. But then you walk up to somebody and they like, they're like, oh, I like your cologne. And you're like, what cologne? I don't know. I like your cologne because you can't smell it anymore. We've been around this so long. I think sometimes we forget what we have. And, and, and it's like, Lord, restore that fresh fire in our spirits. I don't want to get so used to it that I forget what God has given us. And so whatever you're doing for God may not always be visible. But if this is, this is something I don't claim to have mastered, but I pray it regularly. Lord, teach me to be led of your spirit. I want to be full of the fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, and then I want to be clothed with the whole armor of God to protect it because as soon as you try to step out and do something for God, the enemy's going to show up and try to pull the rug out from underneath you. <laughs> and we got to protect ourselves from being discouraged because the enemy is a master, not just of deception, but of discouragement. I've known a lot of good people, Bishop Sales, who have gotten discouraged and they're not living for God now. They started out so well. And they're good people. And I love them. And you know people. And you love them. And we can still pray for them. And there's always still hope. And God can restore. I don't know who I'm talking to. But I think about Moses. Moses was in this position. He didn't want to go before Pharaoh. In Exodus 3 and 4. And he argued with God. I don't think because he was trying to be defiant. I just think Moses didn't feel qualified. And the Lord's like, Mo, you're going, bro. And he's like, what do you mean? I can't talk well. I don't have the capability. Who am I to go before the most powerful ruler in the world? You want me to go before Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. And you know, God just listened to Mo. And after Moses was done venting, God said, Moses, what's in your hand? I said, what do you mean? What's a rod? I'm not going to cast this down. It's a mic- very expensive microphone. But, but he said, cast it to the ground. Well, when he did, you know what happened. It became a serpent. And Moses may have, you know, I was a tough guy. Moses, our ancestors were tough. But I don't know if Moses kind of jumped or what. Or just kind of freaked out a little bit or just. But then the Lord said, take it by the tail. I'm not a snake expert, but I had a couple snakes as a kid for pets, non-venomous. One of them bit me in the neck. (laughs) True story. (laughs) And uh, I know this. When you go to pick up a snake, you don't pick it up by the tail. But God was telling Moses to take his greatest fear by the tail. It was metaphorical, but it was real. And and as soon as he picked it up, it became a rod again. In other words, you take a normal snake by the tail. Well, the snake is going to do what it was designed to do. And it's going to coil back and strike you. But as soon as he touched the tail of the serpent, it became a rod again. God was showing Moses, you're not going in your might, Mo. You're not going in your power. You're going by my spirit. And I'm going to be with you. And I'm going to speak through you. And all the stuff that unfolded, God was breaking down Moses' fear and taking away his excuses. You ever have God do that? (laughs) Been there? Yeah. Yeah. But we're good at excuses, aren't we? I've been guilty of it too. But at the end of the day, why are we here to do God's work? Because if we're saved, why didn't he just rapture us already? Because he left us in the world to be the light of the world. What is in your hand, Mo? 
You're already holding what I have already equipped you. I've already given you the gifts that you need. I've already given you the talents that you need. But if you're not using them, it's time to get a grip on what God has given you to take you to the next level in your faith. <laughs> take that fear that you've got by the tail. And say, I'm not going to let this thing discourage me anymore. <laughs> I think about climbers. I've never been a rock climber. I like to walk along the top of cliffs overlooking the ocean, but I've never been a rock climber. Don't really want to be, but I've watched documentaries of free climbers. People who climb cliffs mountains without any ropes or harnesses and you may be aware already there's a dude by the name of alex honald yeah thank you for saying his name because i was i think i was mispronouncing his name 2008 he became the first free climber to free solo the infamous half dome in yosemite national park and he, he later did a TED Talk. You realize Half Dome's elevation is 8,846 feet. Almost 9,000 feet to the peak of Half Dome. And he climbed it without any ropes or harnesses. You imagine the kind of grip that Alex has? But in listening to an interview that he did, and a, and a couple of speeches he did, and, and I, I watched some of the video footage, and it's mind-blowing. In fact, they interviewed the producer that did the documentary, and he said they had to bring in, they had to hire professional climbers to be the camera crew who would climb halfway up and just be suspended. Of course, they had ropes on, but they had these giant cameras they were holding suspended on the side of this purely vertical cliff just to film Alex. But the producer said, we got all that in place, but then we had one big overriding question that was not a logistical question. It was a moral question. He, and I was really a little pleasantly surprised to hear him say this. I don't know if pleasantly is the right word. But he said, the one question that we had to answer is, is this morally right to film someone that we could possibly be filming his fall to his death? I thought, whoa, at least this guy has a conscience. <laughs> of course, they went ahead and did it, obviously. And it's hard to watch, is it not? I mean, I watched it on my laptop, and I'm like, I don't think I can watch this. Because one slip, the guy's dead. But listening to Alex, he said, some people think I don't have fear. And there are people that exist that have no fear, they say in their brain, like the fear factors missing in their brain. And they do all this crazy Red Bull type stuff. But he said, no, I have fear. He said, the difference with me is my training. He said, I climbed Half Dome and all these other sheer vertical rocks for hundreds of hours he said, I think he said he did half dome at least 50 times with ropes, with harnesses. And he said, I memorized every step. It took him four hours to climb half dome, almost four hours, like right up close to four hours. And he said, I memorized every step, every, where every crevice was, every move I was going to make. My brothers and sisters, in a sense, we're practicing for heaven. <laughs> he said, so when the day came that the film crew came, I had to forget they were there. And he said, I knew I was going to do this without any ropes or harnesses. He said, I had, he said, the entire four hours that I was climbing Half Dome, he said, I felt zero fear. He said, I felt more fear with the ropes on than without them. I thought, well, this is interesting. If we don't live for God with all of our heart, soul, mind, strength, and get a grip now, how do you think you're going to make it when the real trial comes? How do you think you're going to make it when you can't function in society when they collapse the economy on purpose and all this other stuff that's coming? If you can't live for God when it's easy... 
I mean, really, let's be honest, we have it pretty easy right now compared to what's coming. But this cotton candy Christianity garbage is killing us. And I'm concerned that a lot of good Christians who are faithful to the house of God, and that's good, don't really have much of a prayer life. And I'm not singling anybody out. I'm not saying you. And I know there's times it's hard because of so many demands on our time, so many things pulling for our attention. I get it. I understand. But we can't afford to let ourselves be lukewarm in these last days. As the musicians come, I think of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18. And this has gotten me out of more situations than I can even count. He said, in everything give thanks. It's easy to give thanks in the victories. It's easy to give thanks when the bills are paid and no one's sick. And there's peaceful relationships and everybody's happy with each other. But what about... When the enemy comes at you like a flood, can you give thanks when your world is turned upside down? You can. I know you can. Because I've been there. And there have been times I made myself praise God when I didn't feel like praising God. I made myself. But you know what I found? The more I praise God, the peace began to come. I started seeing a little bit of light come into the entrance of the cave. He said, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And then he said something right after that. Quench not the spirit. We usually think of that just in a church service. And yes, it applies. But are we allowing the pleasures of this life to quench the Spirit of God in our lives? I'm not against pleasure. I don't think God's against pleasure. I think God created good, pure pleasure. I think He wants us to enjoy life. But the Bible does give us an alarm. That in the last days, people would be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Nothing wrong with good pleasure, but don't let it triumph over your walk with God. He said, quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesyings. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Hold fast that which is good. Hold fast that which is good. You know what holding fast means? means to get a grip get a grip if you do nothing else in life get a grip on your walk with God young people it's good to pursue education it's good to want to get your degree so you can have the skills you need to go down the career path you feel like you should or that God wants you to but if you don't have any of that you have not lost out in life if you do this one thing. They used to go to the horns of the altar in the tabernacle when they were in trouble. And there they would seek the face of God for his mercy. Sometimes it was their trouble that drove them to that place. I heard a preacher say one time, most people come to God in a time of crisis. We tend to feel ashamed when we're going through a crisis. But there's always light in the darkness. I feel the Holy Ghost reaching for someone today who's in a crisis in their life. And the enemy wants you to feel ashamed. It's, the Lord says it's not your fault that you're going through a crisis. The Lord says it's not your fault that you're facing a challenge that was not of your making. 
The enemy's just trying to discourage you. The way to defeat the enemy is not to stand there and try to argue with him. It's not to get angry and turn away and say, well, this Christian life just isn't for me. You can either run away from your trouble, but it will only get worse. Or you can run to Calvary and say, God, I can't handle this problem on my own. I can't tackle this in my own strength. But Lord, I know you can. I know this is nothing to you, God. I give it to you. I give my life to you. The old gospel writer got it right decades ago. When he said, Lord, I give you the one piece that was missing. Here's my heart. Here's my soul. Here's something only you can hold. The Holy Ghost is reaching for somebody. That the Lord is saying, I'm waiting for you to make the move. I'm waiting for you to give you my lot, your life. To give me your life. I'm not going to make you. I'm not going to twist your arm. I'm not going to force you. But I'm standing here with open arms of grace. The Spirit of God is reaching for some today. Can we lift our hands right now? Jesus. I feel the Holy Ghost is reaching for some young people right now. The Lord is talking to you. He wants to ask you, what's your life going to be in 30 years when you look back? It's going to be the result of decisions that you've made. But have you made this one decision? To lay hold on eternal life. Can we find a place to seek the face of Jesus? I don't care where it is. I don't care where it is. Can we find a place to seek God's face? If nothing else, if nothing else... I don't care if you're 20, 30, 50, 70. If you do nothing else and you make a decision, I'm going to live for God. I'm going to get a grip on eternal life. You have been a success. If you do nothing else, are you hearing me? But determine, Jesus is going to be my everything. That is success. Spirit of the Lord is reaching. He's reaching. The everlasting arms of God are healing someone from the inside out. <laughs>